And welcome in. Late Kick is live. It is Sunday night, January 2nd, the year of our Lord. Let me check the notes. 2022. It's our first show of the new year. We are indeed jam-packed. We are high atop downtown snowy Nashville, Tennessee. One of our buds on Twitter, Jessica O'Donnell, just asked, why? And really, I don't know. I just left Miami, and we are now in freezing temperatures here. We're going to go to Indianapolis later this week, where the forecast high upon arrival is in the upper teens. And um, we are a show with options, and we are choosing this. And that's really the most disappointing part. Like when I write in my diary tonight, Dear Diary, we're choosing frigid temperatures over what we experienced in Miami last week. It was palm trees, sunshine, iguanas, not always in that order. It was great, but we do have a big week on tap. And so the national championship journey is going to take us to Indianapolis, Indiana, and the opportunity to meet Steve Wiltfong and Kelly Wiltfong at their house instead of just on Skype like we normally do. So we've got a lot to get to. I've got some early thoughts on Alabama and Georgia tonight. It's not an SEC championship recap, although the same kind of bullet points that we hit once upon a time when those teams played in Atlanta, yeah, it'll sound like a familiar refrain, but I'm not attacking it from that angle tonight. I've got mm, what are probably going to sound like some hot takes, but they're really not. I just feel this way about both teams. Uh, the bowl opt-out drama, the, the debate, the conversation around this whole thing, it really ramped up this past weekend. There were some comments made on some national networks by some national personalities that got a lot of you up in arms. I rarely get up in arms. I get up in arms about the things that are different than the normals get up in arms about. So uh, this didn't really bother me all that much. I had a little feel on it, but you guys had a lot of feel on it. So we're going to talk about it. Uh, Dave Aranda is Pate State material. We, uh, ever since the Baylor game that we went to, we have a green Sharpie on the desk not because I ever use it, but just because we brought it here, because it represents Baylor and Dave Aranda, the head coach at Baylor, paid state material. They won the Sugar Bowl last night. Now, guys have won New Year's Six Bowl games before, but not everyone does it the year after they win two games. Uh, Dave Aranda trending up, Baylor football trending up. But there are some things about him that are going to merit their own segment tonight on the show, because I want to talk about sort of an inflection point that's happening and you know that we wouldn't just do the segment if it was hyper-focused on Baylor and nothing else, because we don't do a bowl recap for every bowl game. There are some things happening at Baylor that are going to permeate, sort of ripple effect, the entire Big 12 and also the entire landscape of college football. I really want to have you guys paying attention to that. So we're going to talk about that. Also, I've got, I think, like four or five questions. One, two, three, four, five questions from the Late Kick uh, inbox that we're going to hit tonight. So make sure you're following all the social channels this week. For those of you who were following last week, especially Instagram and Twitter, at Late Kick Josh, there was a lot of added value you got from the week that we couldn't put on the show. Uh, we will be, by the way, live from Indianapolis this time in a week. I think that's the show that we're going to do from up there. So uh, set your programming guides accordingly. Okay, so let's dive into tonight's show. I've, I've been on the road a lot. It feels weird to be in our studio right now, to be honest with you. The lighting patterns are different. I actually could hear Kel Colin and Jesse in there instead of just trusting that they're there. So let's dive into the show tonight. All right. Alabama and Georgia are going to play for a national championship again. They played for an SEC championship about a month ago. And that means it's time for one of the absolute lamest things that has become a recent trend in sports, college football, chief among them for us. And that is people out there with no skin in the game whatsoever, no ownership of a network, no stock invested in a network, starting to tell you about TV ratings, and they're going to start to justify their argument based on TV ratings. I don't care. I'm Tommy Lee Jones on The Fugitive. I don't care. Could not care less. You should not care less. Is that right? I think. You shouldn't care. Like, if, unless you own Disney, like unless you are an investor in this, what do you care about TV ratings? And what they're going to do, of course, is they're going to tell you, if this game gets a lower number than its predecessors, oh, that means that it's bad for college football. If it's a good game, it's a good game. Good football is good for college football. Uh, there are arguments to be made that the hyper-regionality of any given matchup may not be best for TV viewership numbers. I know what you guys mean. It's not like we're stupid over here in the corner laughing at you. I know what it means. I don't think you know what it means. Like, if we were to really, by the way, get into the weeds and get into a nuanced television metrics discussion. And I would ask you, like, let's talk about the itemization of account sharing in Rentrack metrics. 
What would you say about that? You wouldn't even know. I just spoke Portuguese to you. So there's a lot of nuance that goes into that argument anyway, and the conversation about modern day ratings. So really, I, if I wanted to, I could tie you in a pretzel when we're talking about that. And then a TV executive could tie me in a pretzel when he was talking about that. All the while, none of it matters, because we got a game, an actual on the field game. That's what we understand. That's what we want to talk about here. I want to talk first and foremost about what this means for each program. This is not the game breakdown. The game breakdown is going to happen later in the week. I want you to make sure you appreciate what you're seeing right now. This could be Nick Saban's best coaching job. I was perusing the NFL draft numbers last night. Do you remember? It wasn't all that long ago. It was last spring. Alabama just littered the first round of the NFL draft. They had six guys, I believe, go in the first round. They had two more go in the 30 to 40 range. What that means is Nick Saban is about to play for a national championship after having to replace eight of the top 40 draft picks in the NFL draft, not four years ago, not, not, it's just last spring that happened. And so not only are they playing without Najee Harris and you got Jalen Waddle out the door, Mac Jones out the door, Devontae Smith out the door, you got your offensive line out the door, brand new quarterback never started, brand new offensive coordinator. Oh, by the way, they lost Jason McClellan and Roydell Williams during the season. You drop the pin and you say, you're kidding me. They're still playing for a national championship. That team should have four losses and they're playing for a national championship. I pointed that out yesterday and I had most people who rightfully were in amazement. Then I had some people who wanted to pretend like they're capable of overthinking the room come in and say, well, yeah, but when you recruit like they do, it's easy. No, it's not. It's not easy even when you don't lose a bunch of guys to the draft and you recruit like they do. If you want to know how true that is, ask Georgia how easy it's been to get to the national championship. Ask Texas A&M. They're loading up players right now. You go ask Jimbo Fisher how easy, five years from now, ask him how easy it's been. I don't care how many times they've gone. How easy has it been? It is critically important to understand what happens once you get the talent on campus. It's not just you go sign up the five stars and then it's, it's kind of Xbox from there and they just go take care of business. That's kind of, we, we use the restaurant metaphor all the time when it comes to talent acquisition. That's like us going to a five-star restaurant and saying, well, yeah, but you've got all the best ingredients in that kitchen. So of course this meal's great. And the chef's over there saying, hello, look, what about me? I'm, I'm a pretty important factor here. Yeah, the talent is what you begin with. It's what you do with the talent. And a lot of it's very green in nature. And then they got a lot of that green talent injured this year and they're still playing for a national championship. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Alabama's playing with house money. I'm not going to tell you they're in a nothing to lose mentality. When you're playing a competitive sport, there's always something to lose for both parties. It's a game. In this case, it's a championship. So you have maximum to lose. Both parties have maximum to lose. But the mentality's different. And I grant you that because one guy's got, what, seven national championships now, half a dozen at his current stop, and the other guy's yet to win one as a head coach. Which brings me to the University of Georgia. What do you think about the magnitude of this moment? I'm asking you, because I really want your answers. I want you to kind of think it out loud before you hear what I say. Because I think sometimes, I look at our comment section, and I think sometimes I'll say something, and if you haven't thought critically about it before, you just kind of go with that, which is dangerous, by the way. If it's my voice that you're just kind of blindly following, what a dangerous proposition in life. So before I give you my thoughts on this, if you're riding around tomorrow down in Osceola, Georgia, or if you're in Fargo, North Dakota, where the high was like negative five today, by the way, I want you to think out loud, how big is the magnitude of this moment for Georgia? All right, now that I gave you adequate time to think it out loud, I'm going to tell you, this is a must-win game for Georgia. Fully believe that. I rarely say that, but I fully believe this is a must-win game for Georgia. It is critically important that they get this done. You don't get many opportunities at this. It is a true must-win situation for them. Not just if they want to win a national championship. Now, this is a must-win situation for Georgia as a program. Sometimes you don't realize that you're at a crossroads until long after it's in the rearview mirror. But this is a different situation. I think you can realize this is a true crossroads inflection point for the Georgia program. Mark Richt had his in 2012, but we didn't know it at the time. 
They get so close in that SEC title game. They get down inside the 10 yard line, but time runs out and they don't beat Alabama. They would have gone on almost certainly to do the same thing to Notre Dame in the title game that Alabama did. Mark Richt ends up being a national championship winning coach. The entire tenor and trajectory of the Georgia program is forever changed and ditto for Mark Richt, but he didn't get it done. They didn't get it done. And that was it. That was all she wrote. This sport, even when you recruit and invest to the level that Georgia does, provides you a very finite amount of opportunities at grabbing the belt. They had one in 2017. They hadn't been back since. Now they're back. They've got the best team I believe they've had under Kirby Smart. This is by far the best opportunity they've had. It's by far the most workable path they've had. And it's by far the most vulnerable, relatively speaking, Alabama's been. This is a crossroads moment for them. And if they cannot grab that belt next Monday night, the tenor totally shifts from always thinking that there are better things, the best is still yet to come, to I wonder if we're ever going to get it done. And I don't think it would be totally unfair to think like that. It's also important to note, we talked about this last week, two weeks ago, I guess it has been now, when I talk like that, I'm talking about as it relates to a Nick Saban world. Because there's a post-Saban world coming up sometime down the road. I'm not telling you, in other words, here's what I'm trying to say. I'm not telling you, if Kirby Smart doesn't win a title next week, he just never will. That's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is, as long as Nick Saban's going to be at Alabama, this will probably be Smart's best shot. I don't know, maybe in a lower percentage situation, somewhere down the road, he does beat him. This is his best shot. And it's certainly the point in time where he's got to get it done before that mood sort of changes around his program. Now, just as we say that, I want to remind you the point we made last week. For everyone, if Georgia doesn't get the job done, who's going to want to sell all their Georgia stock and sell all their Kirby Smart stock? Um, Nick Saban was 55 when he got to Alabama. Kirby Smart's 10 years younger than that right now. And so if Saban coaches for another seven or eight years and retires, Kirby takes over as one of, if not the top dogs, pun intended, in the sport, and he'll still be younger than Saban was when he got to Alabama. Saban's been at Alabama a decade and a half now. Kirby's still 10 years younger than Saban was when he got there. There is a huge window of post-Saban football somewhere down the road for Kirby Smart and Marcus Freeman, whoever is around at that point. But in this world, you know as well as I do, if it comes time for Nick Saban to leave whenever he does and you haven't gotten it done against him, like Dabo Swinney has a couple of times, if you haven't gotten it done against him, it'll always eat at you. It'll always be what they follow the comma in your bio with. Well, Kirby Smart won a title, comma, but it was after Nick Saban vacated the premises. You don't want that. This is his best shot. Side note, just want to point out a side note before we move on here. It's going to shock you, but the expansionists are wrong, as they usually are. You're going to hear in the build-up and lead-up to this game, absent people's ability to make uh, well-rounded football-based commentary and points on this game, they're going to start talking about how this matchup relates to the conversation around expanding the playoff. I'm not going to revisit all our opinions on that tonight. This is not a segment about playoff expansion, but... You're going to have some people tell you, maybe you're thinking this as well, that an all-SEC national championship is proof that we need to expand the playoff. That, of course, is false. What an all-SEC championship is, is just that. It's an all-SEC championship. But I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you that had we still been in the BCS era, we would not have seen Georgia even make the national title game. It would have been Alabama-Michigan. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because we clearly see that these are the two best teams in the country. Uh, Georgia body bagged Michigan the other night. Some people had to see it happen in order to believe it. I was surprised at the ease with which they disposed of Michigan, but we saw it. Okay, so we realized we got the two best teams in the country. I don't think many people are debating that at this point. But in the old model, one of these teams would not have made it. Why am I making that point? Well, I'm making the point because an expanded playoff, just from two to four, allowed this matchup to happen. The expansionist crowd out there is falsely trying to lead you to believe that we need to expand it more so that we can have more opportunities for more programs. The only programs that are ultimately going to end up benefiting from that larger opportunity 
are probably going to be programs that also reside in that three-letter conference down south that a lot of you despise so much, and understandably so. Um, question for you, and then we'll move on. If an all-SEC national championship is bad, what's going to happen when you get to 12 teams and eventually it gets whittled down and within the first couple of years you have an all-SEC semifinal? Because let me remind you of something. The SEC, whose signature you need to sign off on playoff expansion, is never going to sign up if you put a limit on how many teams from an individual conference can make the field. Nor should they. They shouldn't. If I, if I ran the best conference in the land and you needed me, I would never sign off on anything that limited my team's potential to get in your playoff. So you're not going to have that governor on things. You're not going to have that restrictor plate on things you think you'll have. So all of a sudden, you know, you got Jimbo doing what he's doing at A&M. Of course, you got Kirby and Saban doing what they're doing. Billy Napier, early returns, very strong at Florida. Josh Heupel looks to be building an offensive machine at Tennessee. Brian Kelly is one of the most successful coaches in the last 20 years of college football. He's at LSU now. Sam Pittman's doing a remarkable job in year two, going into year three at Arkansas. Lane Kiffin just played in the Sugar Bowl in year two at Ole Miss. This conference is loaded, absolutely loaded. And now you want to expand, and there won't be a limit on how many of these teams can make it. You really want to see yourself in a situation, a tournament in college football, where you get in with no cap on the SEC, and all of a sudden now you're watching meaningful playoff games, meaningful playoff games, as opposed to those meaningless bowl games. You're setting yourself up for disaster. And you're setting yourself up down the road for a three out of four or a four out of four clean sweep semifinal featuring all SEC teams. And at that point, you'll look in the mirror and you'll say, who would have ever seen this coming? And I'll point to myself, but I'll take no pleasure in doing it because at that point, things will have already been ruined. You can't go back. You can't go back. No one's going in reverse because the powers that be will cash their paycheck regardless. And the networks will cash their check regardless. And the venues and whatnot, they'll cash their check regardless. Those are almost like bought events. They're already paid for. You are the one who will suffer for that. If you want to limit the SEC's ability to dominate the postseason, a smaller playoff field is the best weapon you can fashion against the SEC. Just like we saw right now, actually, with an all-SEC final. Had you gone back to the BCS model, one of those teams wouldn't have even been able to participate. And now, as it stands, Alabama had to walk a tightrope. Remember this, they lost to A&M. Had they lost one more game and they were behind at Auburn, they needed overtime, they played a very tight game against LSU. They played a very tight game against Florida. Alabama almost didn't make this playoff. You expand it to 12, they'll never not make it. Your best weapon against Bama is a small playoff field. Um, I say that and... and it kind of falls on deaf ears, or death ears, as one of my cousins once said. So we'll just move on, and we'll eventually have to swallow whatever they dish out. But I just want you to think about it. That's all I humbly ask. Actually, I got one more thing to ask. It's going to be cold pretty much everywhere aside from where we just came from last week in Miami. It's going to be very cold this upcoming week. So you may have thought to yourself, we've gotten through it all got my winter wardrobe, or maybe I'm not going to need it. Well, yes, you are, friend. And so whether it's a coat you need, or you want to go lighter, you know, maybe sweatshirt, but you want that team logo, or you want the brand of your choice on there, don't go someplace that's going to jack up the price on you and also does not support the shows that you love. Go to Academy Sports and Outdoors or go to academy.com. Right, and this is the second thing that we always humbly ask in the show. The first thing is to like the video. The second thing is check out Academy Sports and Outdoors at some point this week. Gave away a lot of Academy gift cards down in South Florida over the past week. And so that was one of 14 reasons that we loved our trip down there. Academy Sports and Outdoors, no matter what it is you need at this point, could be a grill, could be a sweatshirt, it could be, I don't know, a baseball bat. Hey, spring is coming. Eventually, they tell me, Academy Sports and Outdoors. That's the one-stop shop to fill your cart, to fill your closet, to fill anything that you need to fill, and also to check off the box and to be able to say, hey, I supported the show with the brand that makes the show being free possible. That's a lot of word salad, but it's very important to take it seriously. We appreciate them. We appreciate you guys and what you do 
with Academy in the name of our show. Really appreciate it. Never gets old to read that. Academy Sports and Outdoors, pretty much your one-stop shop for life at this point. We've got to wade into this conversation carefully. Let me readjust in the chair. Appreciate all you guys being tuned in, by the way. If you're watching live or if you're listening to the replay, subscribe to the channel if you don't mind. It's free. Nothing else goes into it. All right, it's going to be sensitive. I, I guarantee you I'm going, to get, I'm going to get some arguments on this one. You know it's going to be serious because I'm restacking the papers. And that's one of the big, that's one of the big nervous energy moves in the media world. When they, stack, when they stack the papers, that is nervous energy. So what am I nervous about? Well, that's not really, not really all that nervous about it. But bowl opt-outs, big topic of conversation right now. I'm not even going to give you my personal opinion on it. It doesn't matter because they're not going anywhere. Like, of course, I'm not crazy about bowl opt-outs. But I also understand if I had potential top 10 draft money waiting for me uh, a month or two months or three months from now, yeah, I may think differently. So I'm not personally involved and invested. I'm not going to pretend to sit here and tell you you should value my opinion on what someone else should do with their career. I've got my personal feel on it. I hate it when folks opt out. But also, it's really none of my business what they do in their personal life. So the opinions are there too. The, the bowl opt-outs aren't going anywhere. Therefore, the opinions aren't going anywhere either. A lot of you were tuned in, and even if you weren't, you saw it on Twitter or you saw the replays of it eventually, to the college game day broadcast they did before the Rose Bowl. I thought it was insanity, by the way. The schedule that some of those guys like Fowler and Herb Street, Desmond Howard and whatnot, uh, the schedule they had this past weekend, I, I don't think they slept at all. But they did a broadcast of College Game Day at the Rose Bowl Saturday morning. And they were talking about bowl opt-outs and they were talking about the phrase meaningless bowl games and how there's that connotation around these days that if there's not a playoff spot involved or a playoff trip on the line or it's not a playoff game, then the bowl game is less significant and therefore it's meaningless. And it's a conversation we've had a million and one times on this show. That's not what the controversy was. The controversy lied in a conversation that Kirk Herbstreet and Desmond Howard started to have on set about how, in a sense, today's player may not love the sport like yesterday's player did. And Kirk Herbstreet kind of drew some criticism for a direct comment he made. He said, I think today's player maybe just doesn't love the sport like the player of yesterday did. So when that happened, I wasn't watching it live. I quickly was alerted that something controversial had been said. Uh, as is usually the case when something allegedly controversial happens, I went back and watched it and didn't really sense a whole lot of controversy in my own gut. I just listened. I said, oh, well, that's one opinion. And that's, that's kind of you know, where I left it. There was a retraction issued later by Kirk Herbstreet. So he said, look, I'm not saying every play, I'm not broad brushing this. I'm not saying every player doesn't love the game and every player used to love the game. Uh, but he kind of stuck to his conviction of what he, what he meant to say. And I thought it was pretty obvious, by the way. Like when I be, went back and watched it, it was one of those moments where I said, I can tell he was trying to say something that didn't necessarily come out of his mouth the way he wanted to say it. Like sometimes that stuff's clear. And then you got the retraction and you know how that usually goes. The observation afterwards was what was interesting for me. So there were two camps that were the most vocal here. Camp number one was the vocal minority pretending to you know, feign outrage. And that's always the vocal minority that pretends they're fighting for players' rights. And really, they couldn't care less. Really, they're looking for the quickest retweet they can get. And they're also understanding when you get that kind of opportunity of Kirk Herbstreit, a guy who rarely says anything controversial, and a controversial statement coming out of his mouth, that guy's name does incredible web traffic. So if you get a remote controversy and the name Kirk Herbstreit, those folks got to jump on that. I mean, they got traffic quotas to hit. They got to jump on it. So I understand how the game's played. I'm not even all that mad at you. That was the vocal minority. Twitter's not real life. So the more silent majority that I heard from personally was in the camp that we've been in for a long time on this show. We have done probably, Colin, I, I would say back when we first got here, one of the first shows we ever did was, was including a topic on this. The, just this mind-numbing hypocrisy that you rightfully sense when you listen to anyone who's got a problem with bowl opt-outs or who's got a problem with people talking about meaningless playoff games and they are espousing those viewpoints on the same platform that a lot of us think has been 
centrally responsible for those very things occurring in this sport. To put a finer point on what I'm saying, I'm telling you, it's not that any one person like Desmond Howard or Kirk Herbstreit, it's not that they have taken the central role. It is more like an ESPN promotion and marketing department strategy that was hatched back when they secured the rights to the college football playoff that created phrases like who's in and created a marketing plan and a promotion and then a production plan to shove playoff down your throat and to make sure you understood very clearly these games matter and we're going to put not just a brighter spotlight on it we're going to have like a five million candle watt light on this and everything else is going to be in the dark and then there are going to be people on our airwaves who a little ways into the process they start to use phrases like meaningless bowl game and they start to crystallize the playoff and you're watching Central Michigan Toledo on a Tuesday night and in between first and second down there's a timeout called by the coach and instead of that broadcast team in the booth talking about what plays coming up they put up a graphic and they talk about this Saturday and what the playoff picture could look like and it's it's late September and you're watching like we all have been and you're saying why are you talking about the playoff in the middle of a Mac game right now there's a game going on. Call this game. But that's the way it was. And it was like that for quite a while. Then all of a sudden, people in studios a thousand miles away said the phrase meaningless bowl game and suggested that, that, sort, of, that sort of idea. And it started to permeate. And then fans started to talk that way. And everybody else out there in the media ether started to talk that way. And players started to listen to them. That would be my core beef. Like if I'm gonna draw, if I'm gonna draw any kind of umbrage with anything that either one of those guys said the other night, number one, it's the network they're saying it on, and not necessarily anything to do with them. It's the network in general, because they can just feel how they feel. But then number two, it's I don't blame the players. Like I'm not looking at players, even if I despise the concept of opt-outs, I'm not blaming the players. I didn't ever hear a player for Cal or Utah or Missouri start to use the phrase meaningless playoff game back in 2013, 14, 15. I never heard that come out of players' mouths. I heard it come out of TV executives' mouths. I heard it come out of TV analysts' mouths. A lot of adults in the room that should have known better, that should have looked out for the best interest of the sport that they're paid to cover, those were the mouths out of which you heard phrases like meaningless bowl game, an exhibition instead of a playoff game. Well, the players listened, and now you are seeing the consequence of that. Players believed you, the adults in the room, in many cases, when you told them the games are meaningless, and they said, well, if it's meaningless, and especially if I've got prospects down the road financially to look after, why am I going to play? And so they opted out. They opted out for reasons that, quite frankly, are their business and only their business. But it never happened a decade ago. See, anyone who points that out is right. These things never happened a decade ago. What's changed? Well, I wouldn't say the attitude of players has necessarily shifted towards the negative. That's not where I stand on it. Where I stand is the players not really being all that much at fault. I don't question the heart of players. What I'm questioning is how in the world are we about to have adults in the room get mad at kids when all the kids did was listen to the adults? Like that's been our core issue about this from the beginning. And if you've watched Late Kick for a long time, You've heard me do a version of this segment 10 times. And so it's not going anywhere. But I will say this now. For a lot of people who took issue with what someone like Kirk Herbstreet said or Desmond Howard said, uh, here's what I started to sense as the day went on. There was a lot of lumping going on. I want, well, I want to caution you. You can do whatever you want to. I want you to be very careful, though. Because I see this happen more and more um, and I've tried to point out when it seems like I'm doing it that I'm not really doing it. I would encourage you to be very careful lumping every opinion you disagree with about this sport into the same category. Because there is a huge difference in someone who makes a statement you disagree with who is doing it from a foundation of love for college football versus someone making a statement you disagree with and it coming from a foundation of them having really contempt for the sport. They don't feel it. They don't have passion for it. They don't love it. They're not looking out for it. They're looking out for any of a number of agendas that really drive them. And college football just happens to be the vehicle 
you know, they're the parasite and they have latched on to college football and they're using it for all the wrong purposes. So you can disagree with both parties. One of them needs to be in an entirely separate category than the other one does. Because I can promise you one thing, look, whatever you thought about what that entire panel said the other day, you take someone like Herc Herbstreet. If you're a diehard college football fan, and you really want what's best for this sport, you and him want the same thing. Even if you may disagree on an individual topic, you want the same thing. But some of the more nameless and faceless power brokers in this sport that are pushing all forms of quote unquote progress and pushing the game quote unquote forward, those folks don't necessarily align with your values and principles. They are very, very good. They are very adept at convincing you the alternative is true, and they are very, very good at selling you on the right bullet points to get you on board with their line of thinking. Uh, they do not share your values. They just don't. They don't care about the same things you do, uh, and I'm right there with you. They don't care about the same things I do, but for some people, I think that a lot of times there, there's a lot of quick draw out there. You got to have a reaction to everything. Sometimes it's best to just, just put your hands behind your back put the device down and just think for a little while. Think critically for a little while. For some of us, college football does not orbit around something else. For some of us, college football is the center of the sporting universe. And so for some of us, really whether you agree with everything that comes out of my mouth or Kirk Herbstreet's mouth or Desmond Howard's mouth, some of us have the best interest of the sport at heart and that's really where it stops. For us, college football is not a rung on the ladder that you just step on to get somewhere else. For us, college football is it. I mean, for me, it's my livelihood. And I love the sport. And I, I would really love to be able to give to it because it's given so much to me. I'm not a player, but there are other ways that you can contribute positively and give to it. But when you talk like that, some people think it's false. Some people think it's not authentic. I can promise you it's very authentic. And when you see me push back so hard against things that are labeled as progress in relation to the sport that I don't view as progress, I come from the South, okay? And I come from the 65 corridor and the 75 corridor. There are a lot of small towns in South Georgia and South Alabama that got sold on progress once upon a time when those interstates came through. And look, if you're the governor of Georgia or Alabama, it was progress. If you lived in Birmingham or Montgomery or Mobile, if you lived in Macon, if you lived in Atlanta, it was progress. Valdosta, oh, it was progress because it made it easier. Thoroughfares made it a whole lot easier to bring tourism traffic in, and it made it a whole lot easier to get where you were going a lot quicker if you were traveling long distances, but it wasn't progress for everyone. You ask little towns in South Georgia, little towns in South Alabama, it's not always progress for everyone. So if I was the governor of Georgia, man, I wouldn't listen to your cries for a second. There's a greater good being served here. There's, there's, a, there's a larger good being served here. So we're building that interstate, whether you like it or not. But if I'm the mayor of Cordell, Georgia, I, I'm not listening to that. My priorities are different. And so there are two arguments that can be made here with most of the debates happening in college football right now. And part of that is some folks just have a different viewpoint than you do. I'm sitting here with college football being the center of the world for me as it relates to sports. Other people aren't. College football is kind of a stopgap for them. It's something they do on Saturday to hold them over to Sundays. So their opinions are not born out of pure love and passion for this game. Mine are. That's why they're going to sound different sometimes. That's why mine may sound a little more hysterical sometimes. It's just because I probably care about it a little bit more. But whether you agree with it or not, one thing you can always take to the bank is if I'm saying something, it's coming from the standpoint of what's in the best interest of this sport and really nothing else. And by this sport, I clearly mean this sport and the players who play this sport. All right, we can move on now. Uh, we have created sort of a phrase that we use, and we've used it all season, when something is either, when someone's achieving or something happens at such a high level that it warrants special consideration. And that is Pate State material. And Pate State material is the label that we put on Dave Aranda several months ago. And he reaffirmed it last night. They played Ole Miss in the Sugar Bowl. They beat Ole Miss and they not only win the Big 12, they win the Sugar Bowl. They cap a 12 and two season emphatically. They were two and seven a year ago. 
So Dave Aranda turns it around overnight. Uh, Dave Aranda is, he's getting a lot of praise today, as he should. We've been praising him all year, and this really had a turning point for me in the middle of the year. If you've been watching the show all year, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Dave Aranda wins two games last year. He wins 12 games this year. His attitude doesn't change whatsoever. He just perma- he permanently looks like a guy in the waiting room at a dentist office. Even when they pour the Gatorade on him or when he loses a game, it's just always the same. Very even keeled. So why am I talking about Dave Aranda specifically tonight? Well, it is because he had a big win yesterday. But there's something bigger happening here as it relates to college football as a whole. The Big 12 and college football as a whole. And it's one of the major takeaways for me from this entire season and moving forward. So follow me here for just a second because you may think if you're a Colorado fan, it really doesn't pertain to you. Oh, it does. It always does because anytime anyone is succeeding, other administrators are watching because everyone wants to duplicate success. So for a little while there, it looked like the only model that was ever going to work for success from this point moving forward was go find an offensive coach and score 45 points a game. Then you got a little defensive renaissance in a renaissance year, and then Brent Venables gets a shot, Dave Aranda's already got a shot, and Dave Aranda's shining. Um, Marcus Freeman gets a shot at Notre Dame. So there's a very cyclical nature to the sport, but Dave Aranda is a guy specifically that I've circled that I think is going to be a rock star, and I didn't know a whole lot about him as a person before this year. Like as a coach and a person, I'd observed him from afar. We got to spend some time closer to him this year, especially during the week of that Oklahoma game where they ended up upsetting the Sooners. I have zero doubt he's legit after this year and kind of being close to him for that week. I have zero doubt that he's different too. That's the key that I want to hone in on a little bit here because as he gets more attention, which he will, more people will pick up on this. I just want us to be a little bit ahead of the curve. And a lot of people are going to have fun with it. If you're watching on YouTube right now, you see the monitor behind me. That demeanor, that's always his demeanor. Whether they're winning by 40 or losing by 40, that's always his demeanor. Now, a lot of people are going to have fun with that. It's, it's going to be good-natured. But people are going to joke about it because they don't understand it. And I just want to make sure you understand that's not a joke. That guy's not putting on an act for you. That really is the way his mind's working. It is, it is so process-oriented, over-result-oriented, that there is really no room to celebrate. And you may think, well, that's no way to live life. Well, it's no way to live life if you're normal. By the very nature of what it takes to achieve at this level, you can't be normal. Normal guys don't pan out in this sport at the highest level. Normal guys don't really pan out at any, in, in any industry at the highest level. Average people don't, don't make it that high. Dave Rand is not average. And you should be happy that he's not if you're a Baylor fan. But Aranda's the first guy I've been around that rubs me the same way that Nick Saban rubs me. I've been around Saban a lot. I was around Dave Aranda this year. And when I say he rubs me the same way Nick Saban does, I'm not doing the A-B comparison. I'm not saying he's the next Nick Saban because no one knows that. What I'm saying is Nick Saban, when you're around him, he exudes that process over result attitude. And you have long since been able to have fun at the expense of the way Nick Saban carries himself. And he participates in it, like he gets it, he understands. Nick Saban's kind of a showman, even though he doesn't exude it, he understands, like he's got a a role and he's got a persona that has been established out there in the public ether, he gets it. So he plays along with it. Dave Aranda, a lot younger and a lot newer to the scene, so he's still trying to feel his way out a little but Dave Aranda's like that. Dave Aranda's not putting on an act. Like Dave Aranda, you're never going to see him outwardly celebrate a whole lot. Dave Aranda's the kind of guy that's very even keeled, but he does not afford himself time to focus on the results because he's all about process. Now, here's where that really slapped me in the face. This year, when we were at the Oklahoma game, they upset Oklahoma. The, the field gets stormed, and they have put themselves in the driver's seat for the Big 12 championship game, and it was the biggest win in several years for the program. And it was a noon game, so we got to get out of there pretty quickly. We met with Dave Aranda after the game. And he's just come out of an exuberant locker room, as they should be. And we were in his post-game press conference, and I asked him, you know, about about the previous week, because they had lost to TCU the previous week. And I asked him what impact 
that TCU loss had on today's result. And he said, I think it had a big impact. And then he said, that's how I know we really haven't arrived yet. He said, I really, I view it as a failure on my part that it mattered. He said, we've got to get to a point where it doesn't matter. I think that sort of sounded like coach speak and it flew over a lot of people's heads. It just sounded like a throwaway comment. It's worth its weight in gold because he's not participating in coach speak. That's an entire life philosophy that he's choosing to share with you there. He was serious. He walked out of that locker room and whereas the normal folks are looking at it and saying, oh, good for you, look at you, you should be doused in champagne. He's saying, it's a shame that we played at such a high level today after we lost. Because what he's saying is, it took an external factor to maximize my team's performance. Instead of me being able to instill in them the concept that you should be able to perform at a maximum level every week because you should be focused on process and internals over anything external. That was a fascinating glimpse into his mind. I didn't know that that's the kind of guy he was. I do now. But it's very interesting now. I told you this relates to college football and this relates sort of to the Big 12. It's ironic that Baylor played Ole Miss last night because Dave Aranda had options and Dave Aranda chose to stay at Baylor. Lane Kiffin is at Ole Miss because he didn't have any other major options. And I think a lot of those details will come to light a little bit more after this season. But those two guys, those two guys were in a very different situation. They'll both be back at their respective universities next year. Uh, and I'm not here to talk about Lane Kiffin, but it was very interesting. Because Dave Aranda had an opportunity to get out of Waco. A lot of people would have taken it. Dave Aranda's not like a lot of people. Dave Aranda looked and said, this is where I want to be. In fact, he told us that day, think we can accomplish big things at Baylor. I want to be at Baylor. He kind of deadpanned it. He had a flat face and he said it. And I think a lot of people let it go in one ear and out the other. Well, now he put his money where his mouth is and he's staying at Baylor. And it's an inflection point in the Big 12 because Oklahoma is not going to be there much longer. Texas is not going to be there much longer. The big question is in that post Longhorn Sooner world, who benefits from the excess amount of oxygen now in the room. Why not Baylor? Why wouldn't it be Baylor? He, they're in a prime position right now. It's a really good time to be a Baylor fan. And as you look from a distance, if your program's in a position to hire a head coach in the next 18 to 36 months, I'm not saying go get Dave Aranda. If you could pull that off, it'd be a miracle for your program. It's not that. It's every time a new kind of guy has success. Sam Pittman, same way at Arkansas then everyone in the industry is asking, who's our Sam Pittman? Who's the next Dave Aranda? And it's good, it's always good, because then it creates a new pool of potential candidates that to that point maybe wouldn't have been considered for a head coaching job. And so that is really good, because then it turns over a new layer of topsoil at the head coaching level and gives guys opportunities that maybe they wouldn't have had. So Dave Aranda could end up impacting your program or he could just beat your program. Or he could do both. We'll see. All right, let's go to the Q&A. Let's go to the inbox right quick. We've got five good questions here. Uh, the Late Kick Extra podcast is back this week. So this is kind of a version of what the Late Kick Extra podcast is. Uh, Jesse, producer Jesse, yes, submitted a question. He said, what are the three biggest things teams need to have to be able to defeat the Alabamas and Georgias of the world? Well, the first thing they have to have is the necessary roster talent. Uh, this is not necessarily in order. So they've got to have that. But they've got to have the maximum buy-in too, which means they have to have A-plus investment across the board. There cannot be a weak link. There cannot be one area they fall uh, kind of fatally short in because the other programs don't. So they've got to have that. They've got to have the talent acquisition, but they've got to be able to develop and manage it once it gets there or else the previous two don't really matter. They're just wasted. So I would say an all-in culture, top to bottom, that is administrative, university too, that is talent acquisition, and that is player development and roster management. Doesn't help to uh, leverage the portal pretty effectively too. And when I say roster management, NIL is included in all that. Uh, let's go next here. When is the realistic window for the Aggies to get over the hump and win a national championship with the best recruiting class ever. They picked up another five-star today, by the way. I think it's a little unrealistic for it to be next season. Well, 
I don't know that it's unrealistic. I mean, I, it's, it's not that they'll probably be my preseason prediction to win a national championship, but let's just think it out loud for a second. Connor Wiegman's coming in. Uh, Jimbo Fisher was with us on the signing day show, said he's the best quarterback in the country. I think they are going to fast track him. I don't know if he starts next year, but if he doesn't, that means someone beat him, which is a de facto very, very good situation for AM. Uh, they are immediately upgrading on the perimeter at the skill positions. Uh, they will forever, now that they have recruited the way they are, they will never lack on the lines of scrimmage again. They will never lack for quality depth. Uh, they will not lack. They have all those attributes that I just said you need to have. They've got all those things. I think they can compete for it next year. The problem is they picked Bama off this year, but they didn't capitalize on it. They couldn't capitalize on it this year. Uh, it's not going to get any easier to pick Bama off is what I'm saying. Next up, why are people doing revisionist history based on the playoff games saying that Notre Dame or anyone else deserved a playoff spot over a 12-1 and Big Ten champ, i.e. Michigan. Um, this, this is not just relegated to this year. I've seen this happen. We've seen this happen a number of times. Notre Dame, it happened to them a couple of times. Notre Dame gets in the playoff, they get blown out, and then people say Notre Dame shouldn't have been in the playoff. Uh, yeah, they should, because any team that replaced Notre Dame would have had the same thing happen to them. But it's not about waiting for the playoff games and then deciding if the right teams were in. That is a foolish way to go about it. You qualify for the playoffs based on your regular season resume, and that's it. So I should, I should have your opinion on the table about which team should have been in before kickoff of the semifinal games ever happens. Once the games kick off, all the noise stops. Like There is no revised opinion to be had about which team should have made the playoff once the playoff begins. Because what happens in the playoff is not part of the criteria for who should make the playoff. I know that sounds very commonsensical, but I think it has to be stated here. Cincinnati absolutely should have been in there. I, to be honest, I was a little out of it because I was actually uh, covering the game. I didn't know people were even talking like that, but I guess it does make sense. So the revisionist history about who should have been in instead of like Michigan or Cincinnati, I think they were talking about both of them. Uh, just, just brush that to the side. That's casual talk. Uh, next up is Jake. Who outside of the SEC do you see being a contender in the next few years? Someone who can seriously compete with the best in the SEC. Well, the tough qualifier here is he says outside of the SEC. Like, to me, it should be outside of Georgia and Bama. Because I, I want to be able to put A&M in here. Like, I want to be able to include... Uh, Brian Kelly at LSU. But if I got to go outside the SEC, I think we're all interested to see how Clemson bounces back, or if they do, uh, what does Mac Brown do at North Carolina? Because a lot of times when you build expectations for a program and they fall short, but they're continuing to recruit at a high level, sometimes you were just a year early on them. I'll be interested to see if we were a year early on North Carolina. Uh, Penn State is a quarterback away, and they just brought a five-star version of a quarterback on campus and Drew Aller. I will, of course, be very interested to see what Marcus Freeman does at Notre Dame. Uh, Texas has Quinn Ewers at quarterback now. And Texas will now be in year two under Sark, and they are really overhauling that roster. Those are some of the programs, along, of course, with Lincoln Riley at USC. Those are some of the programs that I would look at. Uh, from Rex Castillo, street name Rex Castillo, what are your thoughts on Brian Robinson of Alabama waiting his turn to become the star running back in the world of the modern day transfer portal? I'm so glad that he asked this question because I completely forgot to talk about this the other night and that's on me. Brian Robinson is a poster child for what a college football player is. Like if you want a perfect embodiment of, of the perfect college football player, it's Brian Robinson. Brian Robinson grows up in the state of Alabama. I think he grew up in Tuscaloosa, actually. And he commits to Alabama. He was a four-star running back. Would have already long since starred and probably gone to the league at most programs. But he is on the same roster with stud after stud after stud. And so he's not featured until, what, his fifth year there. And now Brian Robinson has battled injury. And yet he's persevered. And he ran it for over 200 yards in the semifinal game. Uh, played on one leg against Georgia and still put in incredible work, especially in pass pro, and he 
he has the mentality that if you could clone it and put it in everyone else, you'd win every game 100 to nothing. Brian Robinson is everything that is right about sports, not just college football. Like Brian Robinson is a perfect version of a competitor. He's a perfect version of a college football player. I wish we had a million of him. Like Brian Robinson is everything that is right about sports. I, I don't think that you could ever go wrong. I don't think you can promote him enough. I'd make, if I ran a promotional department, he would be my poster child. Brian Robinson is a phenomenal story. You don't know a lot about him because he's not overly outspoken. Uh, he is the tailback for Alabama. Uh, you know when you're watching because he will not let you ignore him. But Brian Robinson's been a great story. I'm very, very glad that um, that question got asked because we did not spend enough time on him this year and the other night. Again, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we're, we're three nights a week, so we're, we're Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. We're here in Nashville all week. We'll be in Indianapolis next Sunday night. Uh, make sure that you are following on Twitter and Instagram, at Lake Kick Josh. I can't stress that enough. There are so many things happening this week. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that pop every single day, and we often are talking amongst each other on those mediums because we don't have a show one hour later that we can just get on here and free flow on the mic with. So make sure you're following there. Thank you so much. We're in a new year, huge things coming this year. Uh, last year was insanely off the charts in every category. You guys made that possible. It doesn't matter how many folks we have behind the scenes. It doesn't matter how hard we work. It doesn't matter how talented anyone is. You are who makes the show happen. We know that. We know that. We know that. So we thank you, thank you, thank you. If you say it three times, it matters a whole lot more than if you say it one time. So let's have a great 2022 together. Thank you so much for producer Jesse, for director Colin. I'm Josh Pate. Have yourselves a great start to your week and a great start to 2022, and God bless.